The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Welcome to Kingdom Life Church. Uh, this is going to be a how-to message. And I read the Bible, but how do I do that? And if you haven't read the Bible, you've got to start there. Read the Gospel of John. It deals a great deal with the, some of the basic truths. But we know that the Scripture says that unless you're born again, you cannot see the Kingdom of God. So what happens when you're born again? Uh, how do I do that? And, you know, we could say, I received Jesus into my heart. You know, even there's some Christianese in there. I received Jesus in my heart. We found people don't know where their heart is. Their Bible heart is more the gut, the belly. It's your, your inner being. It's your innermost being. And a lot of times people want to know, uh, oh, I, I asked him to come into my heart. No, he didn't come into your heart. He stood at the door of, the, of your heart and knocked, and you had to open. So we're going to start with the fact that um, understanding that what Jesus said to us in the last few weeks, he really laid it upon our heart to do presence evangelism. Presence evangelism is that somehow the Jesus in you is like a magnet. It attracts people. Uh, not winning an argument, not convincing somebody, not beating them over the head with the Bible, but the mere fact that there's something in your life that's attractive. And until that takes place, uh, being born again has to take on a new nature. Now, if I was born again, I would have asked Jesus to come into my heart, cleanse me of my sin. That's right. He does that, and you don't earn it. It's a gift. Cleanse me of my sin, and then I'm going to give my life over to you to live to, for you and serve you all the days of my life. But here's the thing. The key is that the nature of God or the person of God comes in. You become a partaker of that divine nature. In other words, that nature now wants to influence everything you say and do. And uh, <clears throat> what I noticed was that, uh, that nature seems to be the least understood part. The authority that's in the Bible is, first of all, God's nature is the primary authority. Secondly, the Word of God. You go, uh-oh. You know, God has said and done things that are not even in the scriptures beyond, that's what the, the, John said, the things that he said and did, the world couldn't contain all the things that he said and did. But his nature is more significant for each and every one of us than his word because the word could be dead letter. You know what I mean by that? It could be just ink on a page and it's like you're reading a book. When the scripture says that Jesus himself is the word, the word was made flesh and he dwelt among us. That means that living word has his nature in it. And the thing that uh, I learned uh, as a young Christian was in Hebrews 4, where it's talking about the word of God. But it says the word of God is living, powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. It makes a distinction between soul and spirit. And verse 13 got my attention. Now remember, we're talking about the Word of God. The Word of God is quick and powerful. It's living. But it says, all things are naked and open to the eyes of Him to whom we must give account. So really what, what God is telling us that the Word that we need is, has to have His nature. It can't just be ink on a page. It has to be the Spirit. And when we become a partaker of the divine nature, then we grow in grace and in the knowledge of God. And God wants to live his life through us. 
uh, in Isaiah, the, the thing that was important was in Isaiah 43, it says, I am, I am. That usually when you see I am, I am, or truly, truly, or verily, verily, that means this is really important, so pay attention. I'm repeating myself on purpose. <laughs> so he says, I am, I am your Savior, and there's none beside me. Well, that, that just eliminated many roads to God, isn't it? I am, I am your Savior, and there's no other one that can save you. I am, I am your forgiver, and no one else can forgive your sin. I am, I am your comforter. I'm the only one that can give you real peace. All other peace is a false peace. I can remember uh, uh, being in the airport, and there was this cult uh, lady that everybody was going, Oh, there she is, and she's ahead of, she was ahead of some uh, Indian cult um, from India. And the one thing she didn't have was peace. It was like a fake peace, you know? It was like, you know, just like I've seen people fake humility, you know? Oh, yes, you know, and it's not real, okay? What's real is, are you a partaker of that divine nature? Nature is superior to his word. And you know what? Jesus came and says, I am the bread that came down from heaven. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. And he had Pharisees and Sadducees, religious people, who came against him. So religion can actually come against the truth of God's word. Religious people, and actually, when we went to Russia and we ministered to people, they were alcoholics uh, on the benches in the park, and we saw them come to Jesus and get sober instantly right before our eyes, and soldiers and the Russian people in general, and the only ones that were mean and angry were the, were the ones that came in the black robe and the hats, the little... I don't know how you can be a communist Christian, but it's a contradiction of terms. But they, they came and they went, and you didn't know what they were saying because we didn't know Russian. The Russian Orthodox, which are pretty much under the government. You, you, the government tells you what you can say and what you can't say. But they were like, all these people were opening, tears falling down their eyes, wanting more of Jesus. And the Orthodox priests were the only ones in the crowd going, <laughs> and they were, I said, wow, there's nothing more angry than an angry religious person. <laughs> Any religion, all right? If it's just religion, if it's not the divine nature, if it's not the love of God on the inside. I can, so uh, these Gentiles, you know, uh, when the early church was blossom, birthing, changing uh, the culture. The culture they ran into was they had many gods. They had lots of gods. And when they began to disciple these people, they said, and, and the, the Didache shows it, one of the early training modules, if you want to call it that, it was really just an outline of how they would deal with people that were clueless. And the first thing they said to them was, you're going to love the Lord your God that made you. The Lord your God that made you. And then you're going to love your enemies. You're going to love your neighbor. That was lesson one. Oh my goodness, what a shock to the system. What, what, I, could see, I could hear even the Pharisees say, who's my neighbor? <laughs> you know, I want to pick and choose who I'm going to start loving here. I'm not just going to love everybody. You know. And yet, God told us recently that the, the thing that he's really speaking to our heart now is that we're in a time of great shaking, a great transition. Um, and the first thing he says was, watch what I will do to the body at large, the church at large, around the world. Watch what I will do. I'm going to take you deeper. Now, if he's going to take you deeper, what's he talking about? Nature. I'm going to take you deeper in my nature. You're going to know my love, and you're going to be able to express my love at a deeper level. Then the next thing is, you, I'm going to take you deeper in relationship with me. And the third element, 
will be you will become a partaker of the divine nature. The divine nature is going to infuse you. You know, did you know that you are a fragrance of either life or death? <laughs> and they told these new new believers that were clueless, they hadn't they hadn't really studied the Old Testament scriptures. They're sitting being taught, and he says, I want to tell you something. There's two ways to live, life and death. That's simple enough? There's two ways to live, life and death. Deuteronomy, Old Testament, chapter 30, verse 19 says, I call heaven and earth as a witness today against you that I have set before you, and this is everybody, I have set before you life and death. And then he cheats, he gives you the answer. It's like, a, it's like multiple choice where they tell you the answer even. That's pretty good, huh? That's like having the teacher's guide, right? He goes, uh, I call heaven and earth as a witness against you. This I've set before you, life and death. There's two ways, life and death. Therefore, choose life. Now, if you blow it after somebody tells you the answer, that's your fault, right? Come on. There's two ways to live, life and death. But the life and death he's talking about it is spiritual life and spiritual death. There's uh, plenty of people that are, that are wondering what is missing. And they're searching. And like I said, they'll go to the army, the bars. You know, before I became a Christian, I searched in everything I could find because it was going to make me happy. But everything I tried didn't work very long. Huh? You're nodding your head. You've, you've been this been this way before. <laughs> you tried this. You tried that. I can remember subscribing to magazines on different topics. Everything from Psychology Today to uh, National Geographic to it didn't matter what magazine it was. I was going to find life. I was going to find purpose in life. I wanted to find what this is all about. And except I was, I went to a grammar school that was a parochial school, and all I remember was I had some uh, mean people, and so I didn't know what I wanted, but I don't want to write religious. I don't want anything religious. Yeah, because I didn't know the difference between religion and a relationship. That, uh, that the real life that he's saying, choose life or choose death, is a, is a relationship. So, um, now, I saw people that when we traveled, and they said, um, they were born again. You tell them John chapter 3, verse 3, most assuredly I say to you, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Born again. Okay, here's where we're going to have fun. How do I do that? All right. Well, we already said you asked Jesus to come in your heart, but you can test it. How do I know if I really did it? When we traveled, huh? We even had a, 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 a module here where the man had been in the church 10 years and was, wasn't a Christian. In name only. But never had the supernatural exchange. So we used to take people up there and pray and say something simple like, I would stand next to him and say, okay, close your eyes. Uh, he said the sinner's prayer at one time. Then I'm going to whisper in your ear a scripture. And I would whisper in their ear, behold what manner of love the Father bestowed upon us, that I should be called a child of God. And have them put their hand right here. How did that feel? Good or bad? How many know what, what the scripture means when it says, Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're a child of God? I'm getting them to see if they really are born again or they just gave mental assent to something without a real transformation or without a real spiritual exchange. And if they said bad, what does that tell you? No assurance of their salvation. Salvation and assurance. You know, people are so afraid of feelings. But assurance means I have no so down here, not just no so up here. Isn't that good to know? <laughs> That's the third no. Yeah. 
I know that I know. I've heard believers say that throughout the years. I know that I know. How, why do you even say it twice? It's because your head understands what your heart has experienced. So you say, I know that I know. But it's very important for every believer. If you're watching right now, um, and you can actually do this, you can close your eyes and say, I've asked Jesus into my heart to cleanse me of my sin. And I'll live for him and serve him all the days of my life. I want, I choose life. I choose that nature, that love nature that loves God, loves people. And you know, those early Gentiles were told to fast and pray for your enemies. How's that for class number one? I go, whoa, wait a minute. Who's my neighbor? Would be my first question in the flesh. And pray for my enemies. Don't you have any idea what they've done? But see, that's the beauty of it. Forgiveness is what Jesus did on the cross. He said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. It doesn't exonerate them. What it does is it frees you from the agony and the pain and the torment that you had going on the inside. See, forgiveness and reconciliation are two different things. Reconciliation requires a response on the other party. If they don't respond, you still are obligated to forgive the way Jesus forgave. And it sets your heart free and liberates you from the bondage of abuse and, and rejection and hurt and fear and guilt and shame and lust and anything else that would try to creep in there. You're free from that when you receive forgiveness and when you give forgiveness. And yes, even your enemy. That doesn't mean uh, someone that's uh, uh, harmed your children, you need to have them babysit on a regular basis if you forgive them. No way. You establish a boundary. You forgive, but the love of God will, will give you the wisdom to establish a boundary. Now, how do I know if I'm born again? There must be a supernatural transaction, and the way you can test if you're watching uh, on, online, all you'd have to do is close your eyes and say, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon me, that I should be called a child of God. That should feel good. might not be lightning bolts, it might not be thunder, but it's going to be good. Because that is the assurance. Faith is the substance. I think we overlook that because we're so uh, against uh, feelings uh, in the church. You know, I can't live by feelings. Well, that's a half-truth. You can't live by feelings, but you, God gave you emotions for you to understand what's going on in your life. If all of a sudden you're angry, guess what? Jesus isn't ruling right now, is he? If you're fearful, that's the wrong kingdom. That's the kingdom of darkness. Fear is the essence of the kingdom of darkness. If you're fearful, Jesus isn't ruling right now. And you can say, oh, I receive forgiveness for taking in that fear. Something that God didn't give me. I don't want anything God didn't give me. And I release, I release myself to live in the life, L-I-F-E, with a capital L, the, the God kind of life. Now, if he said, Born again requires that supernatural exchange. There's two ways to live, life or death. And then the other thing that I saw was that after you invite Jesus in, uh, we use a, a translation from the message because it sounds almost worldly, doesn't it, sometimes? <laughs> but it talks about 2 Corinthians 10. The world is unprincipled. Do you agree? It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. All right, that's slang. <laughs> the world doesn't fight fair. Do you agree with that? All we have to do is look at modern day politics. We find out it's not fair. All right. But we aren't supposed to fight or battle that way. Never have, never will. The tools of our trade aren't for marketing and manipulation, but they're for demolishing massively corrupt culture. And I'm going to tell you something, if, if, if you're new to the Christian faith, if you're just coming in, you just got born again, trust me, the culture is a loud voice, and it's corrupt, and it wants to change you and transform you into its image. God says, no, no, Jesus is in you, he wants to transform you into his image, God is love, and he wants to transform you into being a child of God, 
one that emanates the fragrance of God. God told us that I'm going to take you deeper as a church, and you're going to become a partaker of the divine nature. And it says it's already happening now. You will bear fruit. You shall bear fruit. The fruit of your lips are going to have anointing on it. They're going to have uh, the presence of Jesus on your words. You're going to have opportunity to do kind deeds. And it's going to be spirit-led deeds that are done out of the nature of God, out of the love of God. It's going to be a want-to, not a have-to. Religion has a lot of have-to. But God has a want-to. He wants to put his nature in there to where he's the motivation. And, and God says, not only are you going to have the fruit of the lips, the fruit of divine actions, but you are going to witness changed lives. That means you're bearing fruit, the fruit of changed lives. God only told us from the very beginning to start a church, we're not great evangelists winning people to the Lord, but our strength is to teach people how to move in a greater exchange of life, life with a capital L. Now, if I was going to start over again with some new people, and I'd say, all right, now, here's why it's so important that you have his nature in you. Uh, Galatians 2.20 says, it is no longer I that live, but Jesus, the Messiah, lives in me. All right, so what's that saying? It's no longer I. It, what it means is I'm still here. But that independent me has to stop being independent. Hmm? It is no longer I, that independent I who lives, but Jesus the Messiah who lives in me. Now here's, here's a thought uh, that a woman gave us when she was editing our first book. And she says, what you're saying is that it is no longer I who live, but Jesus who lives in me, suggests that it is no longer I who love, but Jesus who loves through me. What also suggests it is no longer I who forgive, but Jesus who forgives through me. Because what? They that are joined to the Lord are one spirit with him. When you got born again, your spirit and his spirit joined together in a new creation, something that never existed before. But now there's this old nature, flesh, mind, will, and emotions. It wants to, It's like three bad kids. It wants to do what it wants to do whenever it feels like it. But then there's the spirit of God in there that hopefully you get convicted and go, mm, no, I better not do that. I know that person cut in front of me. I think I should go over there and tell him off. But it's feeling really yucky down here while I'm thinking that. So I think maybe I better not. And then you go, oh, I release it to Jesus. And all of a sudden, peace comes back. When the peace comes back, you have an assurance that Jesus is ruling, at least for that moment now, until you blow it the next time. But at least now, if I feel peace, the peace of God is his rule, and he himself is my peace. So I know that Jesus is ruling at this point in time. And I am so glad that I didn't punch anybody or hurt anybody or, <laughs> or say anything that I will regret later, right? Now, it says here in the message, 2 Corinthians, you know, we don't fight the way the world fights. We don't have those kind of tools. Never have, never will. Um, but these tools, these spiritual tools that you now have inside of you are to demolish the massively corrupt culture. Wow. You would be so changed and transformed if you yielded to the Spirit of God to, to literally... Demolish, I think I like that word. Demolish the corrupt culture. Guess what? Without Jesus, you're a product of the culture. You're a product of whatever they say. You listen to unsaved Christians, what do they say? My truth and your truth. <laughs> well, that's your truth. This is my truth. It's not truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. <laughs> I am the truth. It's got to be the 
it has to be the hallmark of what you determine is right or wrong. The world has their own right or wrong, and it's a culture that's trying to transform you into its image rather than the love image of God. Now, it says the purpose of those God tools, and they're not carnal, they're not fleshly, they're spiritual, are for demolishing that entire massively corrupt culture. We use these powerful God tools for smashing warped philosophies, tearing down barriers. I heard it in one of the songs we did, the barriers of religion. You don't need dead religion, you need Jesus. And the truth of God, and what does this truth of God, what do these God tools that you have inside of you, what are they supposed to do? Listen to this. Remember those three bad kids, the mind, the will, the emotions, that they want to lead you whatever way they want to go? <laughs> the mind, the will, and the emotions. It says, God has given you these tools so that he can fit every loose thought. Does anybody have any loose thoughts? They kind of wander around. They're not good. You know they're not good. They're happening in your head, and thank God other people can't hear them. Really. He wants to fit every loose thought, every impulse. Men, when you drive, there are a lot of times that you're doing things in a competitive state on the road, and it's an impulse. It's not God driving. I saw, I saw something on Facebook recently where someone says, you people, just because you're going five miles an hour faster than the speed limit in the left hand, lane, there's a lot of us demonic people that would like to go much faster. So would you please get out of the way? Right? Just because they're going five miles over the speed limit, they shouldn't be in the left lane. They should move over so that all the crazy people can go way faster than that. Does that make sense? Yeah, that was our good friend Holly. <laughs> she posted that. I thought, you know what, that just shows you that the nature isn't under control. He that has no rule over his spirit is like a city broken down without walls. If you're a, you know, walls on a city were to protect the city. If you are without walls, you're just someone that's just going to be slushed around, slung this way, that way. Every wind of doctrine is going to change you and control you. You have no control. The only true control is being under control. If Jesus is ruling, the peace of God will rule in your life. And you know, quite frankly, peace is actually the only legitimate wall that you should have between you and people. How many, you see somebody you don't like walking towards you, what's the first thing you do down here? Oh, there's, there's the boss. I didn't want to see the boss today, but they're coming right at me. I don't want to talk to the boss. Okay, that wall is flesh. And guess what? If the boss says something ugly, it's going to go right through there because it won't guard your heart and your mind. The peace of God, the supernatural peace of God that you got through a spiritual exchange transaction, it will guard your heart. And what will happen is they'll say something ugly and, you, and peace will feel it. You'll feel the ugliness on it because you can discern. It's like a, it's like a sensitive... Uh, a garment of the peace of God, the presence of God. And you'll sense that, oh, that was ugly, but you don't take it in. You bear witness to it. Most Christians still suck in stuff they shouldn't be sucking in. But what do you do if you do suck it in accidentally? I receive forgiveness for taking that in. But peace will guard your heart and your mind, and it won't penetrate if the rule of God is first and foremost in your life. We taught this to third graders. And remember what we said, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water, anointing. And the third grader raised his hand. He goes, well, everybody knows there's no living water in your head. It's got to be the well has water down deep and it draws forth. The issues of life flow from the inside. So what does this do? It fits every Look what these weapons do, spiritual weapons. They fit every loose thought, 
emotion, and willful impulse. I shouldn't have done that. Oh, I knew I didn't do that. It's going to fit those three bad boys, not destroy them, not harm them, but get them to submit to the love of God. Mind, will, and emotions belonging to the love of God is fit together. It says for a structure of a new life that's shaped by Jesus. Isn't that what we want? So you've got to deal with your thoughts, you've got to deal with your emotions, and you've got to deal with your choices. Now, we, the, one of the key things, it'll keep anything the devil throws at you that, you know, these weapons work. The weapons of your warfare, they're not carnal. And they will guard your heart and your mind through the peace of God. But here's something that I saw that in talking about he who has no rule over his spirit, where Jesus isn't ruling over the mind, the will, and the emotions, you are like a city broken down without walls, okay? So what does the scripture mean when it says, it is God who is at work in you to both will and to do? we got to go back to that statement that one of our editors came up with. It is God who is at work to both will and to do. And I can remember two pastors arguing over the word you. And they were both right. The one says, you can't heal anybody. And the other guy says, yes, you can. What was the difference there? They were both right. You, your flesh, you can't heal anybody. But can God use you together with him, flow through you to heal people? I've seen it done. It happens, right? So it's a question of when you say you, is that the new creation born again you, or is that the independent you? Very important. It's semantics, yes, but it's very important that, that the you and the only you we're concerned is they that are joined to the Lord are one spirit with him. That explains the fact that you won't make any mistakes in your forgiveness because if it is no longer I who live, but this union, it's a we instead of just an independent me. It is no longer I, it's now a we, right, who live. We who live, me and Jesus who live suggests that it's no longer I who forgive. Who's forgiving then? The Bible says only God can forgive sin, but the Bible also says you have to forgive sin or else. How do we get the two together? With the we. It is God in me that releases that forgiveness from the heart. Unless you forgive, Matthew 18, from the heart. You can forgive from the head, and have it do nothing because there's no supernatural unction to it. There's no divine nature. It has to be, it is no longer I who forgive. It is no longer I who live, but Jesus who lives in me. It is no longer I who love, but Jesus who's loving through me. What does the scripture say? We love because he first loved us. You can't love anybody in reality until you've got the love of Jesus in you. Even mother love, and this is Mother's Day, oh boy, I'm going to get in trouble now. Even mother's love, which is probably the most beautiful thing in the nat natural, is a mother's love for a baby. Father too, but this is Mother's Day, we're going to emphasize them. The most beautiful thing <laughs> is mother love, and yet without Jesus, it is totally selfish. Totally selfish. Totally selfish compared to the love of Jesus. See, it's easy to love what's yours. That's why God demonstrated his love toward us so clearly. 
he sent his only begotten son. You might give your life for someone else, but would you give your son's life for someone else? No. Mother love doesn't do that. That's the distinction on the demonstration of that supernatural love for us. Now, when we would minister to people, we found out one of the greatest hindrances to people experiencing the divine nature, really having an encounter with God that was real, reality, was the will. We went to uh, churches, and we said this before, a thousand people, and we would stand on the platform, and Jennifer and I would say, point to your will. Ninety-eight percent pointed to their temple. That is not the door of your heart. That will, that is not will. That's where you make decisions. That's where you think. The will is here. This is the door of the heart. When you open the door of the heart, you're allowing God to come in. Down here is the epicenter of your spirit. Now, I believe your spirit fills you from head to toe, but this is the epicenter. This is the door, the will. The will's here. The conscience is here. Have you ever done something wrong and went down here and go, <laughs> don't want to do that. <laughs> Even non-Christian policemen and firemen say they go with their training that they've learned. They can go by the book, but they also said, I have to, I have to make a gut call. I have to do intuitively what was needed. That's coming from the spirit. That's coming from your gut. Intuition, intuitiveness. What else is down here? Oh, guess what else is down here? Your conscience. Conscience, the will. What else? Seems like almost everything's down here. I think we better learn to pay attention to what's down here. What do you think? If there's so much down here, oh, up here I have thoughts. Most people want to live up here in the ivory tower of thinking and figuring out. Oh, because they're so smart. They could figure stuff out. But God says, your conscience is here. Pay attention. The seat of the emotions are here. Now, they'll fire up. They'll go, Whoa. what is that? Jennifer teaches it in a scientific name, the left vagus nerve. The left vagus nerve means that if there was suddenly a crash in this room, pow, before your head could figure it out, the emotions would cascade through your whole body, head to toe. Oh, Somebody dropped the ladder in the hallway. That comes later. Emotions, every, and here's where I saw people getting emotionally healed, left and right. New people that were just baby Christians, didn't know nothing. They were getting healed left and right emotionally of all the baggage. Once they found out what I learned in prayer as a baby Christian, every thought has a corresponding emotion. This isn't taught anywhere near enough. And now in the 90s, so that means the church will take forever to catch up, science, science has found out, and I think it was 97, I think it was about 25 years ago, 99, 1999. If you want to get the facts right, Dennis, don't shoot from the hip, ask Jennifer. <laughs> She'll give me the exact. In 1999, they discovered emocognition, emovolition. The emotions control your thinking, and the emotions control your choices. Now, you can be a clever person. I can override that. No, my emotions would like to slap that person, but I'm not going to do it. That's not right. I'm not going to do it. But down here, the anger is still there. It doesn't don't go away. Emotions don't die. They get buried alive. And guess what happens when they're buried alive? You may have overrode it with your superior intellect and behaved. But later on, you're going to walk home and kick the dog, kick the cat. Because that anger all of a sudden exploded later after you got home. Does that sound familiar? Emotions don't die. They get buried alive. And here's the beauty of being in love with Jesus. Jesus, no counselor, no medication really ever deals, removes the emotion. They're all coping mechanisms. Coping. And thank God for some coping mechanisms. There's a lot of unsafe people wouldn't be around today if it wasn't for medication and psychiatrists. However, 
Jesus is the only one that can take your pain and your sorrow. When Jesus died on the cross, he took our punishment. You don't have to live with those punishing emotions. You can give them to him, and he'll take them. You know, when he died on the cross, we usually see the, the sins, but in reality, he took the punishment for our sins. So you don't have to be punished by sin. You have the beautiful gift of the forgiver living in you. You can forgive others. You can forgive yourself. You can even forgive your enemies just to set you free. He took your sin, and he took the punishment for that sin. Now, this flesh wall, if you want to go deeper into the divine nature, as God told us that we were going to do as a church, if you want to become a partaker of that divine nature, not just up in your head, but actually a transformed individual, going from glory to glory, faith to faith, victory to victory, if that's really what you want, then the first thing you're going to have to learn to do is get rid of that flesh wall. Hmm? You see the person that just fired you on your job or, or someone that did something terrible and you, you're in Walmart and you didn't see them coming, but now they're coming and the first thing that happens down here, and don't tell me it doesn't, first thing you see, you see somebody you don't want to see and it goes, Rrr. you tighten up the gut. That's a wall. And it doesn't work. It's the devil's wall. It's self-preservation. You're trying to protect yourself when the only one that really can protect you legitimately is God's peace. will guard your heart and your mind. But you've got to try it. And you say, peace, I can't understand. Peace sounds passive to me. How can peace guard my heart? And I give the example, we did it on Sid Ross' program didn't we, on the supernatural power of peace, how valuable peace is, is I worked in a halfway house where a guy, uh, by discernment, I could tell he was going he's going to leave. And then you call the police. That's the procedure. You call the police if they run. But it was a halfway house for guys that were getting out of, out of jail. And the atmosphere, interesting. As a Christian, you could feel the atmosphere charge even with nobody saying anything. And even the, the pastor that was in charge of the whole meeting, he, he recognized the atmosphere just changed. Someone's going to do something they shouldn't do. All right? Well, I'm standing by the exit door, and this is the best lesson I ever got. I'm standing by the exit door, the only exit door. <laughs> and he came with a knife. He didn't take his medication, and he told me to get out of the way which is, by the way, procedure is you get out of the way and you call the police. And the peace of God increased. Now I'm going, I have more confidence in the peace of God than all your thinking, all your rules, all your regulations, all your, but don't you better watch out now. The peace of God has never lied to me. Now, there's fake peace. and You've got to know the difference. Fake peace is when you... Uh, I really think I need to get a new car. Yeah, I want, that's called lust. I want what I want, and I have a peace about it. Yeah, you got to discern between that, all right? That's not the real one. The real one is, I don't understand what's going on here right now, but the peace of God is increasing. I'm not moving. And it was a beautiful thing to watch, the power of peace. The God of peace will crush, you know, the Bible says the God of peace will crush Satan beneath your feet. That's pretty militant, isn't it? So it's not just passive rest. All right? The peace of God is love ruling. And with love ruling, that peace guarded my heart. All of a sudden, it seemed like an hour, but it was probably a matter of a minute. All of a sudden, he was going to cut me, and the next minute his hand started shaking, then he dropped his knife, and he went to his knees, and then they gave him his medication. But God taught me that lesson that day. I have more confidence in the supernatural peace of God than all of the reasoning put together. God won't lie to you. If he puts his peace on it, he's putting his stamp of approval on it. But you've got to be aware that you are a manipulator by your natural flesh. You are a conniver. And you try to say, I've got a peace about it when it's not God at all. You want the real thing, right? 
Yeah. Okay, so willpower. What I learned was that people, even in the church, that have been in church a long time, did not know their will was here and did not know how to yield or surrender their will. They would try up here going, I, I'm yielded to God. I, I, I want to do what's right. I, 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 and, and what's coming from here is what? Anxiety. That ain't God. He's not anxious about nothing. He's not up there wringing his hand. Oh, my God, what am I going to do with Dennis? He's, he's, he's misbehaving today. Oh, no. <laughs> it's not about God changing me. It's about me surrendering to his presence and letting that change me. That's the transformation. And I saw that when it comes to the will, in the world they only have three choices. Fight, flight, or lay down and be a doormat. It's to call that faint. <laughs> in other words, the scripture that God used to teach that was when they went to push Jesus off a cliff and he walked through the crowd. Now, I've never walked through the crowd, but the supernatural truth in there was imperative for me. It was that Jesus didn't fight him and start punching and swinging. Get out of the way. You're not pushing me off the cliff. He didn't run away and hide. He didn't fight. There was no flight. And he didn't just lay down and let him trample him. He yielded to the will of his father and literally walk through the crowd. That is a beautiful picture of the supernatural power of peace, if you will yield to it. Yielding and surrendering is not quitting and letting somebody else win. Yielding and surrendering is acknowledging God. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him, and that acknowledges through divine, intimate relationship. Acknowledge him, and he will direct your path from the heart. You need to be heart-led, spirit-led, not head-led. <laughs> There's a new one for you, head-led. I don't know about you, but Jennifer and I, apart from Jesus, we're both very headstrong. <laughs> didn't mean we were smart. It just meant we were headstrong. I want what I want, and I want it now, right? I can remember Jennifer telling me stories of her with a little girl going, I'm not doing that. Little granddaughter's doing the same thing, isn't she? Daddy says, no. She goes, I said no. <laughs> I think there's going to be some real issues <laughs> in the days ahead with little granddaughter learning learning who's, who's in authority. Remember, the nature of God is his presence, and then his word has to be with that nature attached to it. So it's nature, his word with the nature attached to it. Then there's conscience. Where's the conscience? Yeah, don't bring it I don't want to see none of this. Your conscience is down here. It's the voice of your spirit. Some of you need to listen to it. Now, why is the conscience not the total ball of wax? Because your conscience is only as good as your word base. Some of you need to grow more in what God says in his word before you can trust that conscience. But right now, I'm not worried about too many people because they've been so brainwashed in this culture, they call good evil and evil good that the only way to get that conscious clean is through the new birth, through the regeneration, through the washing of the water of the Word and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. That You need a renewed mind, but the renewed mind doesn't start by thinking renewed thoughts. It starts by allowing God's thoughts to rise up and choose Him, bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus. Every runaway thought God wants to corral the runaway thoughts, the impulses, and those emotions to make it like, he doesn't want to annihilate your mind, will, and emotions. He wants to make them like the sails on a boat. 
He wants to blow the wind of his loving spirit through your mind, through your will, and through your emotions. That's smooth sailing. That's real living, huh? Okay. So, the flesh wall. So you know the fourth level is what we want as Christians. No fighting, no running away, no laying down and being trampled but yielding and surrendering to the will of God and let the peace of God rule. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. The God of peace will crush Satan beneath your feet. Now, one of the key things that we had to teach, besides the location of the will, was we went throughout the entire body of Christ, and there was people that were Christians for many, many years, and they were trying to forgive. Something as simple as that beautiful gift that God gave you, they were trying to forgive. Well, that told me that they had willpower and mind, mind, will, but there was no spirit in it. Because if you did, it would be Jesus the forgiver in you, and you, the we, releasing out of my belly flows rivers of living water. So we saw that they had to learn to do three things. Now, we dealt with a lot of people that were sexually molested, raped, uh, abused, and we saw a, a pattern. In, in those cases, the vast majority always had to forgive three ways. First of all, they usually blame themselves. I shouldn't have run out alone. I receive forgiveness. But then they also had to release the perpetrator. Now remember, that doesn't exonerate the perpetrator. It doesn't mean they get off scot-free. They're going to suffer from the hands of God with all their wrongdoing. They will be held accountable. But you have to be free of the emotional pain. And you want to release forgiveness. Jesus takes the pain and the trauma, which is a big word nowadays, trauma. Uh, in my day, abuse was exaggerated, but there's legitimate abuse, isn't there? There's severe abuse. It's getting worse. But I saw people that were upset with somebody saying, you're abusing me. Okay, And so by discernment, I had to learn to find out what was the real root of the situation to bring forth a remedy. Nowadays, there's a lot of little fears that people are calling traumas. Now, we've got people coming back from war zones. That's trauma. We've got people that were in car accidents that were traumatized. But don't call everything that you fear a trauma. You're making mountains out of molehills. Make sure that you realize that do what this woman did and many women did who were, who were raped or molested. They had to receive forgiveness that it wasn't their fault. Even though they blamed themselves, I shouldn't have went out alone, blah, 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 blah. You release forgiveness to the perpetrator. But remember, you say, that's too hard. I can't do that. I don't even want to do that. Well, that's the I that's by itself. Jesus, the forgiver, is going to do the forgiving with your cooperation. So the big and little suddenly is being diminished, and you're letting God do what God does best. And he forgives that perpetrator no matter how horrific it is. Your view has to change that it is God who is at work in me. It is God who is forgiving in me. Only God can forgive sin, but I need to forgive, so I'm going to cooperate. But who's the greater power, you or God? That's the problem. When you say you can't do this and you can't do that, that is the problem. That's that independent self that's been a Christian for a long time. What you need to do is release that independent self and become part and parcel of the new creation reality that says, it is no longer I who forgive, but Jesus who forgives in me. Anyone that says forgiveness is hard is missing the point. You're not functioning as a believer. You're functioning as an independent, selfish self, <laughs> whether you know it or not. And then they would forgive the perpetrator when they saw that Jesus, all this does, it doesn't affect them. It affects you taking the poison out of you because he's the only one that can take your pain and sorrow. And then... Believe it or not, as unscriptural as it is, people have to forgive God. <laughs> when I say it's unscriptural, it's, God didn't do anything wrong. But guess what? You judged him. <laughs> There's people, why did God let that happen? Right? Come on, you may have said this yourself. Why did God let that happen? Well, that makes you to God and him to people. That's not going to work well. 
in the kingdom. <laughs> you kind of quit pushing Jesus off the throne <laughs> and sitting on there like it's yours. All right. Anything you're going to do with Jesus has to be co, <laughs> co-operative. That's the key. And when God's saying that, all right, I release, I release that judgment I made against God. And no matter what kind of shaking is taking place in your life, no matter what kind of disruption there is, no matter what kind of trauma is taking place, God says, I'll tell you what, you cling to me, and what's going to remain is going to be the glory. I'm going to shake everything that can be shaken, but what remains is going to be the thing that you want more and that you need more than anything else. So you can look to the shaking or you can look to the result of the shaking. When God says, heaven and earth, I'm going to shake heaven and earth, you know, the, the beauty of that whole thing is what remains is what you really need what you really want, whether you know it or not, right? All right. I'm going to cover in the next two minutes. <laughs> I'm going to cover the, the five <clears throat> spiritual functions. And if you're watching, I want you to practice this in your prayer time by yourself. First of all, I want you to close your eyes if you've invited Jesus into your heart, if he's cleansed you from your sin, and now you have a relationship. You know what? You need to start working on this relationship. It's not all done now, right? This is the beginning. And so in your beginning, you learn to, one, I receive. When a reading of the word, I don't just read the word, the letter on the word. I read it and pray while I'm reading it. It's not just for my understanding. I'm reading, I'm feeding. I'm drinking and feeding, not thinking and reading, if that makes sense. And so I'm reading it, and I want that living word, all right? I'm receiving. Then anything starts distracting you with people or situations, I release forgiveness so I get back to where I need to be in the presence of God. I release forgiveness. So there's receiving, there's forgiving. Then there's releasing. Releasing is when you start to get into idolatry and don't even know it. The idolatry is that you are a steward, not an owner. Parents, on Mother's Day yet, mothers, those children belong to God, not to you. The Bible says children are the Lord's. So, all well, the ladies try to say that, well, that's my body. No. There's a person inside your body, if you're pregnant, that is the Lord's. It's not yours. It's God's. And from the very beginning, he says that they are his, not yours. Romans 14, 14. I'm going to close with this. They are, Living Bible says it really good, Romans 14, 4. They are God's servants, not yours. They belong to him, not to you. And God is able to tell them whether they're right or wrong, and God is able to make them do as they should. So you have to understand that you are a steward, not an owner. Parents, you don't own your children. You are called to be a steward. And you're supposed to train them in the way that they shall go. Now what that really means is that presupposes that you're spiritually and emotionally mature enough to handle the job. Sometimes you get run into parents that go, I did everything right, and they still went goofy. <laughs> well, that presupposes you were spiritually and emotionally there, together. All right? And when they're old, they shall not depart. A lot of times, the seeds you sowed, what that really means is the seeds you sown will show at a much later date. So it's not over till it's over. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for this day, this time, the situation the new beginnings that are taking place, all the things that you promised us are coming to pass. Presence evangelism, we want to create the presence of God wherever we go, in the workplace, in the home, school, 
and church. In Jesus' name. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.